Okay, guys, thank you very much, Glenn, for um, inviting me, and thank you for inviting me again since the inception of this fellowship course that um, was very small when it began six years ago and has grown up to become the, the course that it is today. Um, just have to say that compared to the previous speakers, I am totally and entirely boring because I have no disclosures. I don't work with any companies and nobody pays me to go teach anywhere and uh, to give lecture anywhere. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, radio frequency ablation procedure for lumbar and cervical spine facet joint pain. Uh, you all know that the facet joints are true synovial um, planar pair joints that are usually uh, located between the inferior reticular process of one vertebra and the superior reticular uh, process of the next vertebra. You can see on the left, uh, contrast into a facet joint into the lumbar spine, and on the right, contrast into the facet joint at the cervical spine. Innervation, this is, these are uh, cartoons that shows what the referral pain patterns for cervical uh, mediated facet joint pain and lumbar mediated facet joint pain are. Um, innervation of the facet joint, at the lumbar spine level, the, um, uh, between L1 and L4, the um, facet joints are innervated by the medial branch of the primary dorsal ramus of each spinal nerve. Usually these nerves, the medial branch nerves, run um, across the neck of the superior reticular process, uh, as you can see from the arrow uh, on that image. Um, Usually each facet joint is innervated by two medial branch, one at the same level of the primary dorsal ramus, uh, and uh, uh, the other one at the level immediately above. For example, the L4-5 facet joint, therefore, is innervated by the L3 medial branch nerves and the L4 medial branch nerves. Um, oh, sorry, it didn't come, but uh, this is supposed to be a picture showing you the location point for um, uh, the uh, targets for medial branch nerves at the L2, 3, 4, and at the L5 level as well. Hopefully the other pictures will show up with the rest of the presentation. Um, for the L5 primary dorsal ramus, the uh, um, uh, dorsal ramus itself and now the medial branch is responsible for the innervation of the L5 S1 facet joint. And the L5 primary dorsal ramus usually lies between the halo of the sacrum and the superior reticular process of S1, as you can see in the picture uh, in this um, slide. Um, ah, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, this is uh, basically uh, is supposed to be a radiograph that shows targets um, uh, with contrast for L3, 4, and L5 medial branch uh, and dorsal ramus blocks. Um, for the cervical uh, uh, facet joints, the uh, medial branch innervates the cervical facet joints as well, and usually they wraps around uh, the target point, which is the waist of the articular pillar, as it's shown on uh, the uh, cartoon num uh, B. And, uh, Usually the pattern is that each facet joint is innervated by nerves that are located the same segmental numbers as the joint, as the joint itself. So uh, the C5-6 joint, for example, is innervated by the C5 medial branch and the C6 medial branch, different than what it is at the lumbar spine level. And that is true for the cervical spine facet joint and it's true also for the thoracic uh, facet joint. Uh, the target for a medial branch block at the cervical spine level is the centroid of the articular pillar uh, with the same segmental number as the target nerve. So you can see that um, you can uh, find that centroid by um, um, drawing two imaginary lines between the two diagonals of the diamond-shaped pillars as it's shown in the lateral view of this image. And you enter and, and place the needle right at the center of that um, 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 area. Um, 
Um, this is supposed to be, sorry guys, um, uh, pictures that shows the correct placement of needles at the um, 45 meter branch nerve blocks. Uh, and again, here for the uh, C7 middle branch and blocks, I have some images that hopefully will show up later that give you a better idea of where the needle should be placed when you're doing a radiofrequency ablation procedure for the C7 middle branch nerve. Um, this cartoon shows the um, areas where you can place needle for multiples um, um, lesions, uh, radiofrequency ablation lesions, uh, on the lateral surface of the superior articular process of the C7 vertebra, um, uh, across the top of the root of the transverse process, where you can place the needle for multiple um, uh, lesions of the C7 middle branch of the block. The uh, AP view is the image on uh, the right side of that uh, slide on uh, uh, image B. Um, this is uh, what the lateral and AP views of the cervical spine would look uh, when you place the needle in the correct position for the uh, uh, performance of the C7 medial branch nerve block on the apex of the C7 superior articular process. A is a lateral view and B is an AP view. Um, for the third occipital nerve, uh, uh, the image here would show, I'm sorry again, that this has occurred when I transfer all my slides um, electronically to um, uh, our folks here. Um, there are three, usually three targets that can be blocked for the uh, third occipital nerve. They usually lie on a imaginary line that bisects, intersects the C2-3 facet joints. And you can place the uh, needle in each one of those um, three areas uh, along that particular line. Um, Again, I'm sorry, uh, this is another, this should show another view that would show the correct placement of a needle for a, C, a, three, a third occipital nerve block. So when do we perform a radiofrequency ablation? We perform radiofrequency ablation at the lumbar, cervical, and for that matter, at the thoracic spine level as well <coughs> to manage lumbar and cervical zygapophyseal joint pain that has been diagnosed with controlled medial branch nerve blocks. Uh, um, pain that radiates and that uh, emanates from or at the medial branch that innervates those specific symptomatic joints. Um, for the lumbar uh, radiofrequency neurotomy technique, the objective of the procedure is to place one or more lesion into at the level of the neck of the superior articular process. And usually you want to uh, identify the appropriate target zone as uh, localize approximately between the central two-thirds and two-fourths of the neck of the superior articular process as it is depicted in those pictures uh, on the right and on the left. The um, course of the L4 medial branch and of the L5 primary dorsal ramus is well depicted in that, in that area. Uh, sorry. Uh, <coughs> I apologize. Uh, as well depicted by the green uh, um, uh, marked area in uh, the picture on the um, on the right. Um, for a lumbar uh, RFA ablation of medial branch nerves, two particular considerations have apply and have to be always remembered. A typical uh, lumbar spine level, you need to place the needle oblique to the, to the sagittal plane, and I will explain to you why. And at all segmental levels, you want to try to be as parallel as you can to the course of the nerves. The reason why you have to place the needle um, 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 so, um, oblique to the sagittal plane is that uh, if you insert the needle uh, 
along a parasagittal plane, you in encounter a specific structure, the mammillar accessory ligament, that may obstruct the view uh, and the course um, uh, away from the lateral surface of the superior articular process. So you may end up potentially having the mammillar accessory ligament uh, diverting the trajectory of the needle and, and um, forcing you to place the needle in the incorrect position for the lesion to be performed. So in order to avoid the um, uh, ligament, you need to start uh, with your needle placement 15 to 20 degrees from the sagittal plane oblique. Um, the other reason why you want to, and the reason why you want to place the needle parallel to the uh, target nerve is because that will allow you to um, um, be as close as possible and adjacent as possible to the trajectory of the nerve. And when you are going to perform your um, stimulation, sensory and motor, you have better simulation, obviously, and you can encompass most of your target nerve at that particular level. This sketch shows you how um, you can optimally place the needle for an L4 medial branch nerve and what the optimal trajectory for the placement of the needle would be. Um, and if you place the needle, as I said, as parallel as possible to the nerve, you can encompass with your um, lesion a substantial length of that particular nerve. In order for you to do uh, that and to uh, place the needle as possible, as close as possible, parallel to your target nerve, you need to start also slightly below your target zone. That's why when you will do radiofrequency ablation procedure for me, you will always start, see me starting oblique 15, 20 degrees ipsilaterally from the side of the target and slightly 15 to 20 degrees below the target nerve. This consideration, however, do not apply for the L5S1 um, facet joint, or at least for the part of the L5 facet joint, L5S1 facet joint that is innervated by the L5 primary dorsal ramus. Just because the L5 dorsal ramus, um, at the L5 dorsal ramus level, the mammillo accessory ligament is a rudimentary part of the S1. Um, therefore, consequently, a, a longer area across the neck of the S1 superior articular process constitutes the target zone. Uh, you can see here um, the uh, needle uh, that on a lateral and on AP view, AP view is not seen uh, uh, unfortunately, but on the lateral view, you can see where the active tip lies just opposite to the middle portion of the neck of the superior articular process. And on, uh, if that image on the right would have been visible, you would have seen the tip of the needle lying against the lateral surface of the neck of the superior articular process. Um, this shows the uh, uh, radiographs, again, lateral and AP. The AP did not show up on this picture, unfortunately, again. Uh, but you can see that the active tip is uh, located opposite the middle of the neck of the superior articular process. If you been, have been able to see the pictures on the right, the tip of the needle would lie just against the lateral surface of the neck of the superior articular process. For the cervical uh, uh, radiofrequency neurotomy, you can see in these pictures where the uh, needle tip should be placed in order for you to have placed the needle correctly for uh, RFA ablation of the C6 to C3 to C6 medial branch nerves. Uh, and you can see uh, in uh, uh, the lower portion of that image how you uh, where the needle should be placed for the uh, uh, correct placement of a, for the C7 medial branch nerve RFA. Um, usually you want to place the needle um, in order to have the appropriate um, um, result over the anterior 
third of the target articular pillar. And in order to achieve that, you can place the, the you can position the patient, the patient either in the prone position or in a lateral, the cubitus position with the target side obviously uppermost. <laughs> If the patient is um, uh, positioned in the lateral decubitus with the right, uh, uh, with the target side up, place the initial place in the needle as if you were going to perform a medial bench nerve block. And then eventually redirect the needle anteriorly towards the anterior third of the target articular pillar, as you can see on the picture on the left. Uh, in that uh, radiograph image. Uh, always confirm uh, the correct placement of the needle with the lateral view. In this particular case, you would be, if the patient is in lateral decubitus, even though you have an AP view, you would, be, you would have, that would be your lateral view. So you would have to redirect the uh, C-arm in the uh, lateral slash AP view to have an AP view image like the one on the right side. Um, if the patient uh, for whatever reason cannot uh, tolerate the lateral decubitus and has to be positioned prone, you can start with using a true lateral view. You can raise the skin wheel usually 15 to 30 degrees away from your target, below and lateral to the target, as the, and the target as it is depicted in, by the dotted lines in that picture. And then advance the needle using a lateral fluoroscopic view toward the anterior um, aspect, anterior third of the uh, target articular pillar. Um, if the patient still is position uh, uh, prone, you can use also um, an a you can start with an AP view uh, and then eventually move your uh, C arm 15 to 30 degrees ipsilaterally oblique, raising skin wheel 15 to 30 degrees below and lateral to the target, and eventually redirect and eventually direct the needle toward D. Uh, your target, which is the waist of the articular pillar, as it is shown on uh, the picture on the right side uh, on this radiographic image. And this small little circle shows the area where you can replace or reposition the needle for a second ablation at that particular target level. This is uh, this image in particular for the C5 medial branch nerve. Uh, again, I'm sorry, for the third occipital nerve, you can uh, uh, perform the position with the patient in lateral decubitus or in prone position, and you can use the same technique as have been described so far. Techniques uh, that have been described so far, sorry, that, that Uh, with a patient, again, in lateral or uh, the cubitus or in the prone position. Um, for the C7 medial branch RFA, again, you can place the patient in the lateral decubitus. Uh, and if you are able to visualize the target with the patient in lateral decubitus, you place the needle exactly towards the area that has been depicted in the image on, on the left of this uh, image. Uh, and again, and the patient, if the patient is position prone, you will have to uh, place the needle um, uh, across uh, and, and with a, a slightly oblique insertion, you have left to um, place the needle right across the lateral aspect of the C7 superior articular process, as I've shown you in the cartoon uh, just a few slides um, before. What are the possible complications of this procedure? You can uh, inadvertently injure the spinal cord, and you can injure the spinal cord only if you're placing the needle too medial in relationship to the location of the joints. 
or if you are passing, uh, um, therefore passing inside the vertebral canal and entering the spinal cord. Again, if you're placing the needle too far immediately, you can cause problems to spinal nerves and to uh, the spinal and vertebral artery, uh, especially if the needle are placed too medially anterior to the target zone for the cervical medial branch. Uh, you can cause denervation of the cervical musculature. Um, uh, the so-called drop head syndrome, that is a post-procedure kyphosis that is due to extensor, to extensive extensor muscle denervation is being reported twice in the literature. Um, therefore, you want to limit the number of nerves that need to be blocked as much as possible. My suggestion is try to work to no more than three at a time, if possible. Ataxia with the third occipital nerve RFA is basically a almost universal um, um, issue. Um, the third occipital nerve, you know, plays a significant role in cervical proprioception and has a constant cutaneous distribution. Uh, therefore, if you are placing the needle correctly for the third occipital uh, neurotomy, it's pretty inevitable that you are going to develop some degree of ataxia and numbness. Therefore, in order to avoid that ataxia becomes a uh, very disturbing problem for the patient, try to uh, limit your ablation to one uh, side only at a time. Um, it's possible that if you are having uh, some cases of uh, permanent ataxia have been described, actually. Uh, last but not least, um, this shows the uh, effectiveness and risk of uh, fluoroscopically get the cervical media branch RFA. And you can see that in the hands of uh, experienced uh, practitioner, the um, success rate at six months oscillates between 50 and 70%. And at 12 months, the um, effectiveness uh, seems to reduce quite drastically. At best, it can be uh, up to 50%. Again, I apologize for that problems with all those pictures that did not show as they were supposed to. And uh, obviously, um, again, sorry. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Yes. Yeah, about how far apart do you do bilateral third occipital neurotomies then? Um, I usually do one at a time, as I said, and how far apart? Um, usually if the patient has had a good response, probably three to six months. It is possible that sometimes patients may have um, um, one sided problem and they may have uh, a other side problem because they are overcompensated because of the problem they have on the uh, contralateral side. So sometimes they may realize that um, after the side that seems to bother them the most is addressed, they do not have as much problem on the contralateral side. But sometimes the opposite can happen. You manage one side and they are doing well with the side that you have treated and then start to developing problem on the opposite side. And then you want to make sure three to six months, you can wait a little bit um, longer. If they do not develop any problem with ataxia, they do not develop any problem, any side effects, any complications from the first procedure, you can be a little bit more aggressive and bring them for a, the contralateral side procedure a little bit more quickly. Yes? Uh, do you advocate for um, personally, every time that I have done this procedure, I never injected steroids on my way out after the ablation is being completed. Um, the way I manage that, um, if you perform the procedure correctly, these patients are going to have pain after the procedure for seven to 
15 days, maybe even longer. Sometimes I find myself forced to prescribe some gabapentin for this patient for a short period of time. And usually they do relatively well with that for that short period of time. You don't have to push the dose way too high. And, um, and usually the effect in uh, a matter of one to two weeks, they are going to start to feel pain relief and then the right, the neuritic problem starts to dissolve and disappear. Yes? Um, is there any data to show that sensory testing as versus only motor testing has resulted in like better blocks or, or better drugs? I'm not aware of that. I usually do, uh, obviously, both. And um, um, I try to be as, um, I try to get to elicit sensory stimulation as at the lowest possible intensity of the simulation as I can. And um, I tend not to push the stimulation of, uh, uh, model simulation as high as some of our colleagues uh, do, um, I just want to be sure that at the highest possible tolerated uh, intensity of stimulation by the patient that they, that you do not see any um, um, transmission of the simulation toward the lower extremity. But uh, I, to, um, to answer your question in a different way, I've noticed that uh, not necessarily the Intensity at which you are able at which you are able to achieve a sensory and motor simulation is probably giving you better results long term, but is the uh, number of lesions that you perform at that particular nerve. Uh, I like to do maybe two or three, sometimes even four lesions, in order to encompass the most of the target nerve as possible. Any other questions? Great. Thank you. And again, sorry for the for the for the for the picture.